Hey guys, Erman here from Systematic Productions. Today we'll be taking your raw get good drum samples from sounding like this to sounding like this. So without further ado, let's get the boring stuff out of the way. The first thing you want to do is look at your mix bus compressor. So this is the compressor that every single element of your mix is running through. To get the settings here right is absolutely critical because it will determine how the drums will interact with every other element in the mix. In our case, we'll be running an attack of 30 milliseconds. Now you can run this all the way down to one if you like, depending on if you like a more limiter-like effect out of the compressor. Generally, the lower you go, the more choked the transients will become. With the release, we'll be setting it to auto because that's a very nice safe setting which glues the material together very nicely. If you're after something more pumpy, you can go all the way up to 100 milliseconds or if you want something super glued and subdued sounding, 300 milliseconds. And with the ratio, we'll be doing a four to one in this case, which works very well for heavier material. On lighter material, you may want to go two to one. Now, these settings are also known as the infamous Andy Wallace settings. Uh, they work well on a whole array of heavier material, assuming that you're shooting for a gain reduction of around 4 dB in the box. Uh, you can go 4 to 6 if you're using an analog compressor, they handle things a little bit better. But in our case, we'll be shooting for about 4. Now the next stop on our setup train is setting up our track routing. In our case, what we want to do is make sure that the kick in and the kick sub are going to a kick track, snare top and bottom are going to a snare bus, the tom one and two are running to a tom bus, we've got our overheads and all of our cymbals crushed down onto a single stereo track, and we have all of our room microphones going to a room bus. And this entire thing, all of the shells are running into a shell bus, The cymbals are running into a cymbal bus. For the intents and purposes of this particular mix, this doesn't really matter and it's not critical, but in the cases where you're running multiple cymbal microphones and you want to balance them in relation to the shells very quickly, it can be helpful to set these two buses up. And of course, these two are running into a global drum bus. Now, some things to note about our top-down processing. One thing that we're running on the overall drum bus is an instance of SSL G-channel saturation. I generally find this helps glue the kit together in a way. It expands the lower mid-range, kind of fluffs everything out, makes it fat. It's not for all purposes, but it can work really well in the right case. Now, on top of this, we're also running the entire drum bus to a drum parallel compressor. Now, because this is an outboard unit, I can't show you the settings, but I will explain them to you. We're running a very, very fast attack. We're running a ratio of about three to one to four to one, and we've got about 10 dB gain reduction overall, and we're just blending this underneath the entire drum mix at about minus 11 dB or so. Uh, you'll have to tweak to taste given your own compressor settings, but if you're after something that works across a wide array of material, I would recommend an SSL bus style compressor, whether it be the Waves, the Cytomic Glue, uh, Duende, or whatever else really, just style it into taste. When it comes to mixing drums, the first thing I would recommend doing is looking at the overhead track. So the overhead track is intended to be your overall kit picture, and one of the things it contains is the base phase information for the kit. So the way that the shells interact with the overheads is absolutely critical in how they come through. Moreover, when you EQ the shells, the phase relationship with the overheads will change. So the first thing we want to do is kick in an EQ. When it comes to overheads, very first thing you'll probably want to do is kick in a high pass filter. You can tell we're rejecting all of the low end and all the lower mids. Now, the reason that we're doing this is because of our direct tracks. They'll be handling that aspect of things. And we'll be using the overheads as more of an ambience microphone. So let's keep going. So the very first thing I'll target after this is the cardboard mid range at about 700 hertz in this case. Now the interesting thing about this is when you cut it back to a point that sounds okay in respect to a, a professional mix, the very harsh resonances endemic to cymbals will start to come out. So in this case you can hear the cymbals are getting really harsh. <laughs> 
So obviously our next stop is to tame that. So about 3 dB down at 6K in this case. And an extremely common one across all symbols is 4K. A wide, wide cut at 4K generally clears up the upper mid-range for vocals, guitars, and all other forms of mixed detail. Getting this right can be tricky and you'll often want to be tweaking this in respect to your overall mix to make sure that the vocals are coming through right, the guitars are coming through, that the bass grind is coming through, but in this case somewhere around about 5 to 6 dB appears to be right. Now these kind of cymbals, they're a little bit on the darker side of things, so once we've cut these resonances back we'll probably want to pump up some of the super highs. things nice and sizzly and one of the other things we want to do after this is kill the super 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 highs because they can get quite unruly especially if we're boosting with a shelf like this so as you can already tell it's making a heck of a difference our next stage of processing will target the leftover resonances in the upper mid-range in the cymbals. So as you heard in the EQ example, we EQ'd through quite a few of them up in the upper mids. What we want to do here is get the additionals with an automated tool. So we'll kick in an instance of Soothe. You can hear the resonances start disappearing once I get to 8K, which means that's a good place to leave this. You don't want to overdo a tool like this, it's immensely powerful but also immensely dangerous. This is about right, and the only other thing to bear in mind here is to set the stereo link down to 0%. That will allow the plugin to track the resonances across the stereo spectrum without affecting other symbols. Next up on our list is our trusty limiter. The reason that we kick in an L1 is to control the amount of snare coming through in the overheads. So let's take a listen. Maybe hard to hear through a video, but you can hear the transient forwardness of the snare disappearing when the limiter is kicked in. Generally what you want to do is just jog the limiter down until the snare disappears and the direct track is able to take over. Our final stage of processing involves some G-channel saturation followed by some very light compression. So the compressor is set to a ratio of 2 to 1, a relatively moderate attack and a quick release. It mostly acts on snare transients but it's there essentially to glue the cymbals down into the bed of the mix a little bit more. And with the G-channel saturation what we're wanting to do is subdue the last of the harshness in the cymbals and just make them a little bit more gooey sounding. It's very subtle, but you can hear it bringing things together just a little bit. Now we can move on to processing our kick track. So the first thing to bear in mind with the kick is that we're running a kick subtrack underneath the kick in by about 9 dB or so. From here on out, what you'll want to do is kick in a stage of envelope shaping or transient design. In my case, I'm using the Cubase envelope shaper to add about 1.6 dB of attack with a transient length of about 20 milliseconds or so. You can hear it just pushes the kick forward ever so subtly. Now, you can also probably hear that the kick is very woolly and fluffy sounding, which is what bass drums commonly sound like prior to EQ. So let's get on to that. 
The easiest all-in-one solution for processing bass drums is an SSL style channel strip. So in this case we've got the BX Console E. Now a few key settings to look at in this particular plugin are over here. One thing I'd recommend doing is taking the V gain all the way down to infinity because that just corresponds with noise that we don't want in our mix. The next is the THD. This will default to about minus 60, but if you jog it up, you'll get a nice bit of grunt and fatness from the kick, as we'll demonstrate a bit later. The next is this number, which corresponds to the channel modeling type. So what Brainworks have done is actually modeled each individual channel of an SSL console. And each individual channel in the analog realm varies by quite a bit. In this case, three sounds the best, but in your case, I would recommend just scrolling through until you find whatever is the most symbiotic with your bass drum. From here on out, we go to our filters. So we have a low pass filter engaged at 14K. This is to stop the bass drum from getting overly peaky and brittle even after we boost the top end into it. And we've also got a high pass filter, which we won't use for the time being, and we'll go over a bit later. So with that done, Let's get on to the EQ. First thing we'll do is kick in a high shelf, around about 6.5 dB at about 9K. Give us some of that nice speed metal -y attack. The next step is taking out the lower mid-range frequencies. Now in our case, that's centered at about 235 hertz. Bear in mind that these analog model DQs don't necessarily correspond to the accurate frequency positioning in the real world. So if you were looking at this through a paragraphic EQ, it would generally be anywhere between about 200 to 230 hertz. And we boost in some sub low to compensate for the lower mid range that we've lost. In this case, it's set to 60 hertz, but it's worth noting that these shelves start much higher than that. With the EQing largely out of the way, let's move on to the compression. So this is the compressor section. And what I'd recommend doing is setting the compressor type from the E to the G. The G sounds a little bit better on drum material to me. With bass drums, you'll generally be hovering at a ratio of about 3 to 1 to 4 to 1. In our case, we'll split the difference and do 3 to 5. So let's take a listen to how this affects the mix. Can you hear it clamping down nicely on that initial transient attack? And that's about right. Our next stage of processing will actually take place before the first, so make sure to instantiate an EQ going into the channel strip. Now the reason that we're doing this is to kick in a high pass filter with a slope of our choosing. So in this case I've got an 18 dB per octave one, whereas with the channel strip we'd have been limited to its particular shape or slope. So let's take a listen to this. You can hear it really tightening up those sub lows. So from here on out, we want to target a peak frequency at about 115 hertz. If you look at the spectral analyzer as I'm doing this, you can see that there's an errant amount of content right there. Now you can take away a lot of content here for more of a speed metal-y type sound or leave a bit of it in for more of that fluffy rock thing. It's really up to you and your mileage may vary. To finish this all off, we've got our trusty L1 again. So just like with the overheads where we were trying to reduce the amount of snare transient, in this case we're using it to reduce the amount of errant kick transient left over after this process. So let's take a listen. As you can hear, it does a good job of controlling the kick. So generally what you'd want to do is take a listen to this in context with the rest of the drum mix and subdue just as much as you need in order to get the transient balance right. Moving on to our snare track. What's worth bearing in mind here is that we have a snare bottom track with the wires going in underneath the snare top track by about 13 dB. So this is our starting point. It's a good snare, but it's raw, so it's very flat and woody sounding, so let's try and target that. Like with the kick, we'll begin with a stage of transient design, in this case using DF Trans. 
just giving the attack a little bit more immediacy and using the clip to stop the attack from getting unruly. So in our case, about 30%. Now you don't have to use DF Trans, you can use an SPL Transient Designer, an Envelope Shape, or essentially anything that serves the purpose of boosting the Transient Attack. From here on out, we move on to our gate. Now, the reason that we use a gate is in order to gate out all of the additional material that we don't want in the back, such as cymbal bleed, kick bleed, etc, etc. So the bleed in this track is very minor to begin with, but it's enough to cause us problems. So we'll use the gate, but not with a full range just 20 db or so to drop the cymbal levels back slightly. And as we did with our bass drum, we now move on to EQ. So we'll begin with the high shelf. So a few things we're doing there. The first of which is adding a high shelf as we did before. Centered at about 7.6k, ran about 5 dB. We're removing 13 dB of the lower mid range. Now, this snare tends to get very flat content at about 600 Hz. You're basically cutting this away in order to gain dimensionality, but it will sound excessively thin by itself. But once the room microphones, overheads, and the rest of the mix fill it up, it'll make a lot more sense. From there on, We've got a boost centered around the snare's resonant frequency at about 225 hertz. We're boosting 6 dB, and this is to compensate for the fact that we've cut so much lower mid-range. Now, from here, what you want to do is play the entire mix or the drum mix and just jog up the high-pass filter until it sits just right. Kind of like the thinness and control at about 90 hertz in this case. From here on out, we'll move to our Nav EQ, which functions partly as a saturator for us. Now, the key is to kick in the drive function, and what this allows us to do is crank up the saturation without actually affecting the level of the snare. So let's take a listen what that sounds like. hear the snare becoming more pinned and squared off the higher we go with the line. What you want to use the EQ for is a very, very slight, very subtle upper mid-range boost in order to help the snare cut through the bed of the mix. You can tell it gets harsh very, very quickly, so we have to be careful. So this boost is centered at about 4K. From here on out, we'll be doing some additional stages of EQ. So just kick in a paragraphic and let's get to it. Let's take a look at the spectral analyzer and see what it tells us. We can immediately see that there's a peak that we don't want centered at about 350 hertz. So let's try and target that. Great. And now we'll get some errant mid-range that we weren't able to get the first time around. It's generally a good principle to jog these EQ cuts around with the whole mix going so you can hear what things sound like in context. It's worth bearing in mind that all of these EQ moves are changing the phase relationship of the shell track in relation to the overheads. So not only are you changing the EQ on the individual channel, you're changing how it relates to the overall picture. So EQ with the entire drum mix going as often as possible. Our next step from here is a very subtle low pass filter on the snare. This is to stop the highs from getting excessively zingy, especially after all the top end boosting and mid cutting that we're doing. 
and of course to stop the hi-hat and cymbal bleed coming through the track from really swamping everything else. Now we'll get stuck in some compression. So here's the snare without any. And now we kick it in. So as before with the kick, what we're looking for is something to clamp down on the body of the snare and control the transient attack for us. What we're doing is a ratio of about 3.9, an attack of about 20 milliseconds, a release of about 100 ms, and around about 3 to 6 dB of gain reduction. Now your mileage may vary, the compressor alters the snare tone quite a bit, and the way that it sits in respect to the mix, so this is something that you'll have to experiment with, but generally these settings are a pretty good starting point. And now we kick in a stage of tape saturation. So one thing I've got this set up to do is go at 15 nips, We've got the tape type to FG9, which is more hi-fi, and the 15 nips is actually less hi-fi, which is something I find is quite pleasant on this particular snare. It knocks back the transient a little bit more and smudges things. Now, one of the very first things I do in order to get around the head bump from using tape is to change the bass alignment to reduce the low end by about 2 dB or so. Otherwise, you'll get a bass bump from simply putting this on the track. So let's take a listen to what this sounds like. You can hear it almost distorting the snare the higher we go because we're essentially pushing the input drive to saturate the hell out of the machine. Around about 7.4 is good in my case, but depending on your gain structure, you'll have to adjust it accordingly. The general idea is that you're hovering in the red here and possibly hitting the overload meter on some of the harder hits. Once again, our trusty L1 rears its head, so we're using this for the exact same purpose we've used it for before, to knock back the transient attack of the snare. Being a snare, given the amount of things that we have to do to it in order for it to sound good, odds are there is going to be a bit of errant transient content that we'll have to pull back with this, so let's take a listen. So it's not too bad, but it gives us a little bit more control. The final piece of our puzzle is a stage of parallel compression specifically for the snare. Now the reason that we set it up specifically for the snare is because the snare commonly demands more than the rest of the drums can take, so we do an additional stage. What we've got here is an 1176 style compressor with a ratio of 8 to 1, a relatively fast attack and the quickest release possible. We're going to do about 10 dB of gain reduction and then use the mix knob to just blend it in underneath around about 10%. So you can hear the effect is quite obvious unless it's blended into the mix very subtly. And generally what we're looking for here is just some additional sustain and some additional body from the snare, so just experiment until you find the balance that's correct for your mix. In the second part of the song we have a snare roll section. Now this section involves a lot of ghosting on the snare which would generally be gated out by all of our standard processing. So what we have to do is actually divide up those ghosts and split them up onto a different track. On that track, those ghosts are treated as their own entity, almost like their own drums. So they've got their own compression setting and their own EQ curve in order to pop them out of the mix a little bit more. We won't get into that on this video, but I'll just show you the end result. A bit crazy in solo, but with the whole drum set running, not too bad. Now let's move on to our tom processing. In general, tom processing mirrors the kick very closely, so we'll begin with the stage of transient design, just to boost the attack. Just gives us a little bit more immediacy going into the rest of the processing. Now we'll move on to the EQ. Begin with our high shelf. <laughs> 
Much like kicks, you tend to have to get very drastic in order to sculpt toms around the mix. A lot of lower mid-range cuts, a bit of top end to really get them cutting through. One thing you'd probably want to do is do this EQing while the overheads are running because the phase relationship of the shells in relation to the overheads will affect how they come through in the end. You'll also notice that you'll pick up a bit of additional top end and air from the overheads which won't be apparent in the direct shell tracks. The other thing is a high pass filter. Now this is very much tom dependent. In this case, 77 hertz works quite well. Depends how much low end you can get away with before it begins to conflict with elements like the bass guitar and the kick. From here on out, we'll move on to a stage of compression. Now the compression mirrors the kick compression very closely, in this case a ratio of 3 to 1. A fast release, slow attack, and around about 5 dB of reduction. Or 3 rather. Just to get that transient to pop out a little bit more. And before we forget, we want to target the flat mid-range content at about 700 hertz too. As you can hear, it's a very important range for adding depth and dimensionality to the tom. Processing for our second tom track very closely mirrors the first, so we won't go over it. The only adjustments you really have to make is adjusting the center point frequency for the lower mid-range cut in order to get the low end right depending on the shell size of the tom. So moving on to our entire tom bus. We begin with another stage of EQ and taking a listen to the toms. Now the first thing I hear is a very unpleasant plasticky upper mid-range to the attack. My bet is that's at about 5 kHz. Seems like a decent guess. Now after this, what we want to target is the leftover flat mid-range because raw drum shells tend to have so much excess mid-range content that we don't need in the scope of a mix. So let's take a listen. Alright, now we're starting to get somewhere. One thing that can help a lot on the tom bus in gluing the toms together is an additional stage of very fast attack compression slash limiting. In this case we've got an 1176 style compressor. It's working on a relatively fast attack, a very very fast release, ratio of 4 to 1 and taking off only about a dB. This helps unify things a little bit more. After this, we've got another stage of tape saturation. Much like with the snare, we're running similar settings with the exception this time being that we're at 30 ips. We've got our bass alignment to drop the amount of extra low end we're getting due to the head bump from the tape machine. And then we adjust our input to taste. Around about where the red lights start flickering sounds best. And as always, we have our ever-present L1 limiter. As before, same principle, we're just using it to subdue any errant transient content in the toms. So because we're already doing the tape saturation beforehand, which is serving much the same purpose, we really don't have to go overboard here. It's just an additional stage of control. And now we move on to processing the room microphones. The first thing you want to do is combine them all into a bus track with the relative levels that you want for your mix. So I've already done this for this particular mix, so let's get stuck into the processing. We'll begin with a stage of EQ as we so often do. And the first thing you want to do is instantiate a high pass filter that gets rid of the worst of the flubbiness. <laughs> 
There are people out there that derive a majority of their kick bottom end out of the room microphones, but we're not going to do that for this mix. Our next step is to take care of that flat mid range at about 700 hertz. As you can hear, the room has a profound impact on the tone itself, so the flat mid range is actually in the exact same spot as it was in the overhead tracks. And because Nolly was nice enough to separate out the cymbals for me, we can actually boost the top end into this. On a real drum kit room microphone, you'll be getting a lot of cymbal spills, so you won't be able to do this. Just gives us a bit more air to our snare and drum shells. And we kick in a subtle low pass filter at 16k just for things not to get too excessive for us. Now we move on to saturation and compression. So we kick in a stage of SSL G channel saturation with the drive up at about 6 dB. Reason for this is to fatten out the room microphones even more, give a sense of girth to the overall drum mix. It's a subtle effect, but it works very well in context with everything else. Here's the part where the magic really happens. We kick in a stage of 1176 style compression, ratio 8 to 1, relatively medium to fast attack, fast release, and smashing the snare about 10 dB or so. This is where the room microphones really begin to shine. Because we want a relatively clean drum mix in this case, what we're using is a gate sidechain to a snare. So generally speaking, the room microphone levels will be very low in the mix until the snare triggers them to pop up and give us a wash of ambience just for the snare hits. So let's demonstrate this. So you can hear the microphones really exploding out every time the snare hits. The idea behind this is to set the release just so it's long enough to give you that early reflection fatness for the snare without becoming loose, and setting the attack slow enough that it doesn't overwhelm the initial transient of the direct snare track. An additional effect slash room track that we're using in this case is the room distortion. I've reappropriated the mono room shell track to serve this purpose. So we begin by essentially filtering out the highs and the lows. So this is what it sounds like normally. We turn it into this. And then we distort it. Now the purpose for this track is just to function as a bit of subtle glue for the entire drum kit to come together and also to bridge the drum kit to the bass grid across the mid-range. So let's try and balance this into the overall drum mix. You can tell it has to be fairly low not to drown out the entire drum kit. And with that, we conclude the majority of our drum mixing. The main exception is that we haven't dealt with the reverbs yet. So on the overhead track, the toms and the kick, we have a reverb from the Brucasti M7 library. These are very set and forget, easy to use, and you can find them yourself. On the snare, we've got Stillwell's verbiage. And the reason that we use that is that snares tend to need very nasty, algorithmic, sizzly sounding reverbs in order to cut through the bed of the mix. So I'll just demonstrate what these reverbs sound like in context of this mix in various quantities. You can hear all the ambience levels combining in order to shape our final drum tone there.
So with all that done, let's listen to our final drum sound. Not half bad. If you enjoy what you heard, make sure to grab a copy of the new Modern and Massive Gekwa Drums Library. If you like the processing approach that we used, look into my book, The Systematic Mixing Guide. It contains a categorical chapter on drum mixing as a whole. Beyond that, if you want more content like this, be sure to check out the Systematic Productions channel on YouTube. Like, comment, subscribe, there'll be more content coming. So until next time, thank you very much.